Today we've got a special guest, very interesting interview coming up with comic book creator Fish Lee. Fish Lee's story is also one about triumph over adversity and the sheer will to build a life despite the obstacles in the way. So without further ado, let's meet Fish Lee. just like to welcome you to my podcast, How to Loosen Up Your Painting. And I'm really looking forward to finding out more about your art and comic book creation. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Fish Lee. I don't suppose there's any relation to that other comic book guy called... Uh, Jim Lee? <laughs> Uh, when I was coming up, Jim Lee was the hot new artist in the nineties and everybody's like, you're not related, are you? And he's Asian. But like at one point I had some of my friends convinced that he was my dad because my dad's name is Jim Lee too. And somebody found out that and there's like, it's not the same one. I was like, yeah, it is. And they're like, dude, he's Chinese. And I was like, no, he's not. He's Taiwanese. I don't know where his family's from, but that little lie was enough to convince everybody that my six and a half foot self came from this little Asian man. <laughs> it was so funny, but no, no relation to Stan Lee, Jim Lee, none of them. I'm, I'm my own dude. <laughs> Fish, you are now full-time comic book writer and successful, and you've gone through a lot of things. So I'm going to ask you to give us a bit of your backstory you've had to go through some major issues to get where you are today. So let's just get that backstory because I think it is very interesting. It has been a wild ride. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Mr. Fish Lee from Mr. Fish Comics. I am the creative powerhouse writer and illustrator of Green Zone Life in the Blocks, a new ongoing comic book series from Freestyle Comics. Um, I have always been an artist. I've always been making a living as an artist since like junior high. Uh, did all kinds of random things from drawing portraits and caricatures of people's girlfriends in high school. Um, did a couple logo designs, you know, designed a new mascot for the school, all kinds of weird things as a kid. And, you know, I've worked in t-shirts and signs and uh, logo design and covers for cassette tapes and stuff for bands back in the day before it went to CDs, before it went to MP3s. Um, and then I always had this mystery illness that we couldn't figure out when I was a kid that had all these really weird symptoms. And every year or so I would get a really bad bout and we would go to a bunch of doctors and try and figure it out. And then I would do something really weird. Like at one point my eyes crossed and I couldn't get them to uncross. And the doctors would always say, Oh, he's faking it for attention. Anybody could do that. And you know, I would get in trouble and get sent back to school and we couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, in my late twenties, it got to the point that I was shaking and jerking so violently that I couldn't walk without crutches and ended up in a wheelchair for like 15 years. Um, a lot of days I couldn't walk, talk or see cause I shook so violently, so constantly. I shook so bad for so many years that I can't even mimic the way that I used to shake because I've given myself so many concussions over the years just from shaking my head that if I shake my head no too hard, I will give myself another concussion. Um, so I have to be real careful because I want to act it out. But if I do that, I'm going to be laid up in bed for two weeks and I got too much work to do. Um, eventually at 30, Thanks to a local weatherman on TV running a special about how he had Tourette syndrome, I got diagnosed as having Tourette's. I had been seeing a specialist for years who diagnosed me as faking it for attention. And he said, you know, it's not MS because I don't have lesions on my brain. It's not Huntington's because I don't have the genetic markers. And it can't be Tourette's because I don't swear or bark like a dog. All he knew about Tourette's was a paragraph that he read in med school. I saw this special about Tourette's from the local weatherman when he was coming out admitting that he had Tourette's and they explained more about it. Everybody at church called me. I was like, dude, this guy on TV looks just like you. You've got Tourette's. I was like, 
no, I don't. I don't swear. And he's like, no, that's not it. Just watch it. So I go online and I watch it. Dude looks exactly like me thrashing around in the chair violently as he's explaining what Tourette syndrome is and that it's a neurological condition you're born with. And, you know, it doesn't cause swearing. It causes misfires in the brain. And for some people that might be, you know, inappropriate word shooting out. But for most of us, it's shaking and jerking and twitching and grunts and all kinds of other things. And so I go to a new neurologist. He walks in the door how long have you had Tourette syndrome? I was like, I don't have, he's like, Oh yes, you do. This is absolutely Tourette syndrome. Like he diagnosed me as soon as he walked in, as I'm sitting there shaking on the, the exam table and a couple of specialist visits. And next thing you know, I'm diagnosed at 30 years old. Most people get, you know, diagnosed as kids. Um, I'm one of the lucky people that has, a lot of people get better as they get older and by the time they get out of school, they've learned to manage it well enough that it's unnoticeable to most people. You know, for a lot of people are that lucky. Some of us aren't, some of us continue to get worse like I do. And, um, so I spent the better part of 15 years unable to walk, talk, or see a lot of the time, you know, my ex-wife had to become my caregiver. Um, it was, really brutal, but it never stole my joy. It never stole my happiness. I had to give up my career as a freelance artist for several years there because, you know, maybe the job you want to hire me for is only going to take me an hour, but I couldn't promise you in the next month, I was going to have a good hour that I could get this job done. And when there's a deadline, like say your mother's birthday, it doesn't matter if I get it done the week after we've already missed her birthday, you know, it's done. And so I was out of work for a long time there and I couldn't do much in that time. A lot of times I might only be able to get one eye open and be able to use one thumb, but I realized I could use that thumb to communicate through my phone and talk to people online. And I ended up becoming an online Tourette's advocate for years. And I would spend my days as I was locked up in bed, unable to feed myself. I would be communicating with people around the world and encouraging them and, you know, telling them that it's going to be okay. And I would counsel with new parents that just got their kids diagnosed and they think the whole world's over and be like, no, no, this, your kid's going to be awesome. Like, they're, And then they'd find out how severe I am and they would freak out. And I was like, no, 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 no. Look, they're, not many people get as bad as I am right now. Like your kid is most likely going to learn how to handle this pretty well. And you know, they're going to have a great life and maybe they're going to twitch and jerk a little bit, but that's just our body burning off all the extra awesomeness. They're also going to be really smart, really creative. The brain's going to run really fast. They're going to have great creative ideas pouring out of them left and right. They are going to excel at whatever they put their mind to. Um, and we make great actors and artists and musicians and athletes. Like we really excel at this stuff. Um, so that became the better part of my life for about 15, 16 years. And then with some upgrades in the medications, some new experimental treatments, uh, learning how to surf the waves of the Tourette's rather than trying to stand in the ocean fighting against it. I have, I learned to cope with it better. I learned the things that my body needs, like getting plenty of rest, managing my stress, eating regularly, things like that, um, that have helped make my life a lot better. And now, luckily, knock on wood, God willing and the creek don't rise, a lot of times I can go several days without anybody noticing that I have Tourette's at all. And, you know, here recently I've been yelping out a lot of random stuff and the kids find it very funny. But uh, I can go big periods of time sometimes without anybody noticing now, which is crazy to me, but that freed me up to be able to start working again. And now I had to figure out how am I going to rebuild a freelance career from nothing? And then, uh, my ex-wife just disappeared out of the blue. And now all of a sudden, not only am I disabled and, you know, trying to figure out how am I going to build a career, but now I've got to like feed my kids, pay the rent by myself. And, 
I was really blessed that some connections I made ended up getting me work in indie comic books, you know, and all small press indie comics. But over the last four years, as you can see behind me, like I've worked on over 40 books in the last four years. And I've built quite the name for myself, quite the reputation. I am found out I'm one of the fastest guys working in indie comics right now because I knock out books like nobody's business. And, you know, part of that is thanks to the fact that my brain isn't wired right like everybody else's and it runs really, really fast. And it kind of freaks out new clients when they work with me for the first time because they're used to getting a page or two a week. And sometimes I will get a whole book penciled in like three days and they're not used to that overwhelming onslaught of pages coming their direction. Um, but you know, it has worked out really well for me. I've made a name for myself. And like I said, I've got to start in my own series now and which is really amazing. This next year, we're going to be putting out six issues next year. And we've got another, the second and third issue are fixing to go to Kickstarter, uh, the first couple of weeks of December. And I'm super excited. Everybody has loved the first issue. And getting to work on my own book, like getting to do comics is a dream job from being a kid. And I get to pay my bills drawing muscle men in their underwear, beating each other up. But now to get to do my own comic and to be able to pay my bills doing that, that's mind blowing. It's it. I never imagined I would get to do this. It's, it's fantastic. I can't be happy. <laughs> That that is a fantastic story, but you know you mentioned you mentioned one setback you were you were having there with Tourette's, and then you said you're really blessed because you know something else happened, and that just stood out. It seems you constantly looking for the the blessing or the you know what what's the good that is this setting me on a different direction? Do I need to look down this road? Is this Whereas, you know, you'd think despair and depression would be the road you're going on, but turning things into a positive spin, and I, I can't, can't quite understand just how, how you manage that. <laughs> I get that a lot. I, As a Tourette's advocate, I have often had people get very angry at me in the Tourette's community because they are very miserable and their life is over and there's no hope because... You know, their eyes twitch a lot and they sniff and grunt at work or they had a coughing tick during COVID and their life is over and they're miserable. And why was I not miserable when I was trapped in my body and I, you know, couldn't feed myself or bathe myself? Why wasn't I miserable? And it really all just comes down to what you look for in life. And a dear friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, shared a story one time with me that just literally changed my life. So I'd share this story as often as I can. And, you know, he explained that a buzzard looks for death and decay and suffering to feed upon. And a hummingbird looks for life and joy and rebirth and growth. And if you release both of these birds in the same patch of woods, they are both going to find exactly what they're looking for. The woods did not change. The situations did not change. Both things were there. There was life and death. There was joy and there was sorrow. And they find what they're looking for. And that just really struck me. And so even at the worst of times, I make a point of seeking out the things that I'm blessed with. And my new wife can attest to you because sometimes it kind of freaks her out. But when I'm really having a bad day and I'm seized up again and I can barely talk and I'm locked up and I can't move my hands and I can't walk, she will hear me mumbling and, you know, she'll be trying to make out what I'm saying to see if, you know, like, do I need something? Does she need to call an ambulance or something? And then she will realize I am listing out things that I'm blessed with. And that can be, you know, my amazing children. That could be the fact that, you know, even though I was disabled, I got to be home with my kids. I got to be there when they got home from school. I got to help them with their homework. Uh... I might not be able to make it out of my recliner some days to sit at the dinner table, but I can enjoy watching TV with my kids in the living room at night. Um, 
I'm a good friend. I'm surrounded by people that love me. I have an amazing new wife now that just, I am blessed beyond measure. I never expected to have somebody so amazing in my life. Um, our kids are doing well. My boys are getting married and having families. I get to live out my childhood dream of drawing comic books now. Like that is amazing. Once I start counting these blessings, the fact that I can't see or speak or walk right now is pretty irrelevant compared to all the things that I've been blessed with. And as long as I keep my eyes focused on that, you know, it's easy to have joy. I could wallow in all of the things that I've lost. And I did have to grieve those things as I went through disability. And, you know, I'm also a carpenter and I can build almost anything. It was a guaranteed given. I was going to build our house. I'm a giant. So I was going to build our house with, you know, eight foot doorways. So I never have to duck again. There were going to be cabinets down low for my wife and cabinets way high for me that I can reach. There were going to be countertops that were way high for me and a sink way up here. So I could wash dishes without hurting my back. And like having to let go of that and realize I wasn't going to be able to do that was heartbreaking for me. I was always the guy that like, if you had a need, I would show up in the middle of the night and be there. I would put underpinning on your grandma's house in the winter, in the rain, if she needed it. And then to have to change from being the person that helped everybody to the person that always needed help was tough. I love kayaking and canoeing and bicycling and realizing that I was never going to have the balance or the coordination in my body again to not drown myself in a kayak. That was hard. Like I was going to go to Kauai and, you know, canoe through these, you know, through the ocean and through these underground streams that come up into the waterfalls and the jungle. Like that was one of my life's goals. I'm not going to get to do that. That was hard. I had to mourn those losses and deal with that. But I can sit there wallowing in that and, oh, woe is me, I can't ride a bike anymore. Or I can focus on the things I can do. And you know what? I bought a three-wheeled bicycle and now I can't tip it over. So, you know, there are ways around some things and some things I just had to let go of and be okay with that. But, you know, I'm not the guy that can help everybody anymore. But I'm also the guy that had a particular way of helping people with Tourette's, especially newly diagnosed parents in the worst time of their life. And that was an awesome blessing. So, you know, focusing on those things keeps my joy high. <laughs> and, you know, what you also said in the, the beginning, when you're talking about your backstory and all of the different kinds of jobs that you had to take on, the different freelance things you had to think for yourself, because artists have to be resourceful. Um, you can't just say, well, I just want to paint this one subject when you don't have food on the table you do what you need to do and you will absolutely you will learn how to do stuff real quick and there are so many jobs i took on that i had no business doing i had never done before like i bit out a job sculpting these giant fiberglass polar bears for dixie cafe one time when they were switching from having bars to ice cream soda fountains and they wanted to stick these in all of their restaurants and i bid a job for something i had never done before got in way over my head but i figured it out as i went we built like 47 of these things and installed them and then you know they wanted to make them cool and fun so kids would want to climb on them and we did and a kid climbed on it and chipped his tooth and then they pulled them all out <laughs> But it was an amazing job that I got a lot of experience on, and it taught me that there's not much that I can't figure out when the time comes. Yeah. Now, when it comes to comics, and if I recall correctly, you, your first real introduction into to comics as a, a way of living was to illustrate for writers. Yeah, you, sorry. You also were making comics to help the Tourette's or Tourette's Awareness? That was the first comic that I self-published. I did a Kickstarter, raised money for it, printed it, distributed it, published it myself. It was T-Man and Hyperstrike. And he's the living embodiment of Tourette's Syndrome. He has all of our combined 
ticks, which is funny, but he has all of our combined brilliance and creativity and speed and agility too. And, uh, and his partner has ADHD and she uses it to build this armor that runs off her extra energy. Um, purely designed to encourage kids because like in my work as a Tourette's advocate, I kept running into people, you know, grown adults like me that were too afraid to go to the grocery store, too afraid to get a job. They can't go outside and do anything because they're convinced everybody is going to line up like they did in middle school and start making fun of them and start chanting names at them. And they were so damaged in school that the rest of their life, they basically lived as a hermit. And that broke my heart. Like I met one kid who was 19 years old. He was on disability. He was living in the projects, you know, his life is over. He's never going to be able to get a driver's license. He's never going to have a job or a family. And when I started asking him about his tics, he blinks a lot and he swears a couple times a month. And I was like, dude, I could find you a job anywhere. I know all kinds of places you can work in the back. Nobody's going to care how much you swear. The guys back there cuss way worse than you do. But his dad told him he was broken when he was a kid and they got diagnosed. So he's broken and there is no way he can ever have a life because he's broken. Cause that's who he is. And I don't know how to fix that. I've, I've tried to be encouraging. I've tried to be uplifting, but I don't know how to fix a lifetime of you're broken and something is inherently wrong with you. So I figured the best thing I could do was try and encourage the kids when they're young before it gets that far. So I created this book purely to encourage kids, to uplift them, to help remind them that they're awesome before the world, you know, knocks them down and tells them that they're a spaz. And the response I got from kids around the globe just blew me away. Like I wrote it to be inspiring, but then I get these letters from these kids and I would just be weeping in tears as I read these letters and getting videos of this curly haired little girl jumping up and down on the couch because she's so excited because she saw T man had one of her ticks. So she's really helping him in the book. And it was so awesome to do that. And I had planned out to do like another six issues of it, but that was also right around the time my whole world changed. And now all of a sudden I have to make a living by myself. And it also got attention from other people in indie comics that started hiring me for a cover or a pinup or a couple of pages here or there. And next thing you know, I've got more work coming in than I can do. And I was way too busy over the next few years to ever go back to doing one of my own books. And when you're trying to survive and especially trying to build a business again from scratch, if you're willing to pay me today to do your book and I can feed my kids and pay my rent, I'm going to do your job and put my ideas on the back burner because I have to do my ideas for free today, hoping they're going to pay off in a month or two. But if you're going to pay me today, I'm going to take your money. And next thing you know, I had three months of work prepaid in advance, then it was six months, then it was a year. And, you know, that was an awesome, amazing feeling knowing, you know, this money is there. I can't touch it till I do the job because that's stupid. I'll, I, that's a bad mistake to make, but it's there and I'm safe. All I have to do is do the work and then I have that money to pay my bills. And that was a very secure feeling, especially when the whole world goes haywire and shuts down. and You would think drawing muscle men in their underwear, beating each other up would be a non-essential job. I was afraid I was going to be out of work real quick, but when everybody's locked up at home with nothing to do, entertainment became a big deal. And I had nothing but steady work. Like I was turning away work left and right. And that has been absolutely amazing. And one of the things that has helped build my career, if I could share with every artist out there, I took a sample of my work one time to a famous comic book artist who was at a local comic book show and I showed it to him and he very politely told me I sucked and all of his criticisms were absolutely correct. And I had an excuse for every single one of them. We didn't have a very long timeline on this one. The client was a jerk and they weren't paying much and they were always down my neck and I didn't want to do my best work. And he said, none of that matters. 
the reader is not going to see any of that. They're not going to know that they were a jerk. They're not going to know that they were only paying 20 bucks a page. All they see is your artwork and your name. This is the work you do. And the worst thing you can do is have your work be different book to book because these guys paid more or this guy was nicer. And then your work just looks inconsistent and they don't know why it's inconsistent. They don't know all these other issues. It's like, this is your work and your name. It should always be your best work. And when I started applying that, and it didn't matter how much the job paid, it didn't matter how big a jerk they were, I don't have to work with you again, but this job is going to be good. And that has built my reputation, and everybody loves hiring me now because they know my work is always going to be consistent. It's always going to be top-notch. Actually, some of the best books I've done have been for some of the most outrageously irritating clients that I don't want to work with again. But because I won't let the work be bad, they got a little extra shine on their work, and you know it came out extra cool. And it has built my reputation so if you can apply it absolutely do it so how did you get to know how to draw comics did you study it self-study did you always draw comic book characters i've always i've always drawn i was you know like the best artist in kindergarten but that just meant i could draw the coolest dragster out of a triangle in two circles you know but i put a little smoke behind the wheels and i put a little circle for the helmet and that made it cooler um my brain works differently than everybody else's so it made drawing a little bit easier for me and when they started teaching us more ideas of how to draw i picked them up very quickly and and incorporated them into my little doodles but it wasn't until the Goonies came out that I actually get, got serious about drawing because I fell in love with Data in the Goonies. I wanted to be Data. I wanted that jacket with the grappling hooks and the, you know, the punching glove coming out and oil slick coming out of my shoes. And my mother, who was a saint and a brilliant woman, said she was not going to take me to the junkyard to get parts for my jacket I wanted to build until I had detailed plans because she knew I'd bring home everything that I thought looked cool. I'd be bringing home bumpers and stuff like, I'll use it, I swear. And my room would have been full of junk and our whole house would have stunk. She was brilliant. So I started drawing plans for my jacket and then I got into like Inspector Gadget and then I had to figure out, well, how can I strap a lawnmower onto a football helmet so I can make myself fly and, you know, like that's not going to break my neck. And the designs kept changing and changing and then it became, you know, like a whole suit of armor so I could be a superhero. And then next thing you know, I've just been drawing all this stuff for years and I realized I'm never going to get a power source powerful enough to let me fly in a suit of armor that I can carry. Like, you know, unless somebody actually invents an arc reactor, that's never going to work. So at some point I realized it's just easier to draw this stuff and not have the limitations of trying to actually build it anymore. And that became fun. And then I, I saw an episode of Scooby-Doo one time where they were saving a comic book artist from his superhero creation that was haunting him. And that was the first time I realized you can actually do this as a job. And I realized all of my story ideas that came to me, all of my, ideas that were inspired from the toys and the cartoons I love to watch and the movies I love to watch. All of this could be combined with my ability to draw and I could actually tell my own stories and create my own worlds. And I was done for after that. That was all I wanted to do from that point on. Um, so you mentioned that your, your T-Man uh, comic really developed a life of its own as people got to notice it. And then you got Uh, more work as a result. If we're looking at a a young person listening to this or watching this podcast who love to draw, how do they take that that hobby into maybe a side hustle and then maybe eventually full-time? What's the most important steps they need to take right at the get-go to even think that this can be taken beyond something they do privately? My number one advice for anybody that wants to make comics, whether it's as a writer or an illustrator or a writer illustrator like me, is start making comics. Make comic after comic after comic. Start with little four and eight page stories 
And I know you're worried that they're going to suck in the beginning, but be free, my beloved children. They will suck. That's okay. Start making them. You will get better and better and better and better as you go. The more short stories you tell, the better you will get at telling a story in a small amount of pages, which will make you better at telling longer stories. You know, a lot of people try and jump into telling their magnum opus idea that's 300 books long in the beginning when you don't have the skill set yet to do that and you don't you don't want to start on your big epic poem you want to start on short stories and like take nursery rhymes and reimagine them in a different way you know i mean what if you know i don't know what if mary had a little lamb was a horror story what if little boy blue was set on an alien planet you know just do whatever and start making little short stories. The extra bonus about making short stories is there are always people that are looking to put together anthology books, and it's much easier to get your short story into somebody else's anthology. Let them do the hard work of getting it published and getting it out there. You get your story in print by making four or eight pages, and somebody else does all the hard work. It's great. Um, and you will get more and more experience at it. I have been working, making money as an artist since junior high. I have always been good. I've been better than most other artists around me. Uh, there's always been people better than me, but I've, I've always been pretty decent. And I've always made a living off it. I've always been good. Over the last four years, my work has increased exponentially. I am so much better and so so much faster than I used to be because there is no comparison to doing one illustration a day for a t-shirt or one illustration a day for, you know, a CD cover for a band or a logo for somebody's, you know, car wash business and drawing panel after panel, page after page, day after day, like you will never be concerned about drawing hands again after your 10,000th hand. Like you will not be concerned about drawing the face from that upshot from three quarter view after you've done it a thousand times in these comic books. It's almost like animation The just the sheer amount of repetition that you have at drawing these things. I never imagined it would have made that big a difference in my artwork, or I would have seriously focused on this a lot harder 20 years ago. My second bit of advice to people that want to be a comic book creator is it has never been easier to do this than it is now. Like 20 something years ago, when I graduated out of college, if I wanted to self-publish a comic book, I still had to find a printer that would be willing to print 5,000 or 10,000 copies because that's the lowest number they would run through their printing presses. And I had to come up with 10 grand, 20 grand to pay for this. And that was, that was a lot harder to do. Trying to find other writers and artists. I was confined to people that you meet at work, people that your friends know, people that live around you. Now you can meet other artists and writers from around the world like that on the internet. I've collaborated with people all around the globe on projects and it's amazing. We can send huge files back and forth to each other instantly over the internet. You know, when I graduated college, you had to FedEx these pages to New York for them to scan them and, you know, put them through the printing presses. It's a far different world now. You can go to digital printers and print one issue of a comic. You can get one issue like this with glossy pages, full color printed for like three bucks. If you just want one copy or you can order a hundred copies and take them to your local comic con and sell them yourself for very affordable prices. You can run, you know, a Kickstarter now and make enough money to do your little print run and run 500 copies off, send them off to your backers and have 400 in your back pocket to sell for the next couple of years and see if it works without being out a whole lot of money. You can go on to webtoons and publish it for free. And possibly if you get a, if you get a following, which is tough to do, but if you did, you could actually make a little money on it and you can do that for free. It has never been easier to get your work out there. And I have seen a lot of people, 
that cut their teeth making a webtoon that nobody read, but they got better, got better experience. They do another webtoon that a few people read. They do another webtoon that gets a decent following, makes a little money, and then they sell that webtoon as a combined trade graphic novel at the end to make some money. And then next thing you know, they're they're their own self-publishing company, and they're making a living publishing, you know, five or six comics a year and doing great, you know. It's never been easier to do this yourself. You don't have to be held to getting in the door at one of the, you know, two or three big publishing companies to make it, you know, and even now they only really want to take people that have already made it on their own in the indie circuit and proven that they have the chops and then they'll take them and put them on you know, one of their cool books, but then you got to deal with corporate and all that stuff. And you can't do whatever you want with a character because they got to worry about the toys and the action figures and the movie rights. And, you know, I can do whatever I want in green zone. Like, you know, my lead character is an eight foot lizard man. I could kill him off in issue four. If I want to, I'm not going to, but I could. And, you know, I don't have corporate overlords saying, no, 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 he's too cool for toys. We can't do that. You know, it's my story. I can take it wherever I want. And I love the freedom of that. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what is what are the, the greatest benefits? Also, what really is not so great about doing the indie work? But I guess you've answered a few of those already. It does have its plus and minuses. Like, I always thought, of course, I would self-publish my book. Why would I want to share that money with somebody else? I can pack packages. I can place orders. I can do this myself. So when I did T-Man and Hyperstrike, absolutely, I self-published it. And I placed all the orders and I did all the packing and shipping. And, you know, and once the books went out, I spent the next three months just taking orders from people that got excited about the book and wanted to buy it now that the Kickstarter was over and, you know, packing packages, going to the post office every day or two. I spent three months just taking orders and shipping books. That's three months that I could not make a book because I was too busy selling this one. And I realized while I can do all this, I don't like it and I'm not very good at it. I'm good at a whole lot of things and my brain running really fast works to my advantage making books, but like my OCD and stuff really stresses out over making sure that I got all the packages right and that the, all the letters in the, in the address are correct. And I stressed out so much over that stuff that I was losing sleep and I was like, okay, this is worth paying somebody else to do this. So like when I did Green Zone, I signed with a small publisher and they handle the printing and the shipping and the filling orders and you order on their website and they ship you a book and I get to make awesome books and I get a stack to take with me to conventions and sell and when I do live appearances and stuff and everybody comes away happy. And I like that a lot better. You might be really organized and really like the whole printing and shipping aspect. I don't like that. I'm not good at it. And that's okay. I can't be good at everything. And, you know, it's definitely harder to get attention when you don't have a corporation like Disney behind you pumping advertising into it. They can make kids want what you're selling if they didn't want it before. They can just advertise it enough and you'll want it. I don't have that kind of power or money. So I have to build an audience more gradually, more organically. It's a lot more hustle on my side to do that. But I also have the freedom to tell my own stories and do what I want, and I like that. I sell less books doing indie comics than I would doing more mainstream comics. Even if I went to a bigger indie publisher that was in all the comic book stores like Dark Horse or Dynamite or something like that, they would sell a lot more books, but I would make a lot less per book. So actually going the Kickstarter route and doing small publishing, I'm making about as much or maybe a little bit more than I probably would be making if I went through one of those publishers. So it's a trade-off. You know, I put a lot more hustle into it this way, but I have the freedom to do what I want. The number one question I think all artists starting out is, all right, how do you get noticed? Uh, I know you've mentioned a few ways just getting your work in front of people, but it sounds so easy when we when we say it. <laughs> but uh, marketing, getting noticed, 
and getting some sort of hope that your work might take off, what would you, what would be your top tips for a young person? It is so hard getting started to convince people that you can do what you say you can do. Like that is the hard part. Like it doesn't matter how many sample paintings I showed to people in the beginning when I started doing murals back in the day, that's a different thing than them seeing pictures of a finished mural. Once I did a mural in my uh, sister-in-law's house for free for my nephew, suddenly I got a whole lot more jobs because I had photos of an actual finished mural that I could show them. I was showing them amazing small paintings of like what I could do on your walls. Eh, that wasn't doing it for him, but pictures of a finished one. Okay. If he did it for somebody else, then maybe he could do it for me. And and of course, I started off working cheaper in the beginning than I did by the time I ended and, you know, and got to bump up my price as I went. And I had more happy clients under my belt and more people that I could point a new client to. Be, oh, well, if you'd like references, you can talk to these 10 people that I did murals for and they'll tell you that I did a great job and, you know didn't make a mess of their house, didn't track paint all over the carpet. And comic books was the same way. Like I had the skill set. They could see that I could draw cool pictures, but drawing a cool pinup or a cool cover is very different than drawing sequential pages over and over again. And, you know, I was lucky that the first paying job I did was inking for a guy on a book. Very few people read, but I made friends with the letterer on that book And he's one of the nicest guys in indie comics and is friends with everybody. And he hired me to do a little eight page add on story for a book he was working on. There was just going to be a little addendum at the end, a little, you know, extra bit, like at the end of a Marvel movie or something. And the work I did on that, he started showing to all his friends and they were amazed by the quality. And, and like, I forgot a belt on one of the characters is a little bitty, little bitty belt. And it, he was in every panel and I forgot it. And we were at the end of the book before my buddy realized. And he's like, you know what? It's no big deal. Forget it. And I was like, no, 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 no. The belt's supposed to be there. The belt was in the references you sent me. I made a mistake. I'm going to fix it. And I went back and I fixed all eight pages, every panel and put that belt in everywhere. And doing that, because I had made a promise to myself that I was never going to put out bad work again with my name on it. Doing that sold me to so many people because they're like, okay, this dude takes his work seriously. He does. He wants to put out a good product. If we need a revision, he's not going to gripe and complain about it. That kind of thing really helped me. The big things that you got to do in trying to build an audience now is like, posting on social media. You've got to let people see what you can do. You've got to post regularly, whatever that schedule is for you. The thing I keep telling people is you cannot post too much about what you're doing. Like you might feel like you're spamming everybody's feed with pictures of your mural or your painting or your caricature or your comic book. But the fact is with the algorithms, people are probably only seeing one out of every 20 posts that you make anyway. So post, 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 post. Try and make as many different posts out of one image as you possibly can. Like I like to do time-lapse drawings. I can set, because I work digitally, I can set my program to just record while I'm drawing and then turn around and turn that into a post. Then I can post the still image. I can post me talking about that image and make several different posts out of the same piece of artwork and get more mileage out of it. Um, But post regularly and post in the places that people are looking, use hashtags and stuff that people are watching for this kind of thing. You don't want to use hashtags that aren't related to what you're doing, but look at the ones that are popular. Look at the ones that keep showing up on the stuff that you love and start incorporating those. Watch the people that you love. Watch the people that are further up the ladder than you that are doing what you want to do, making a living doing what you want to do, and watch their posts. See how often they post. How many hashtags do they use? What hashtags are they using? Um, You know, Learn from them. That has been so much more helpful to me. Because especially with comics, it is so much more about 
getting the fans to like me and want to follow me. And then they will follow me from book to book to book. Like if they like the Sentinels, which is one book that I illustrate for a good friend of mine, then they'll follow that book and they love my work there. And lots of people back that and it's going full time now without me. Cause I can't keep up with two full time series. Um, they love me on that book, but if they don't get to know me and love me and not just my art, they won't follow me to green zone. So like I started doing a podcast with a friend of mine. He started it. I joined in as a co-host just so I could get to know the fans more, get my face out there more. I started doing TikToks, and now it's all, Hey, it's your uncle fish, favorite comic book artist. And you know, I'm getting that out there in front of people's eyes and that's helping me build a following to point. Like I just recently, I'm going to geek out a little bit, but I just recently, like the last three or four comic book cons I went to this year started having other artists recognize me at the show and be like, Hey, you're Mr. Fish. I follow you on Instagram. And that's awesome. I was at Barnes and Noble a couple of weeks ago and out of nowhere, a lady recognized me and geeked out and wanted to take pictures with me and stuff because she follows me online and loves the comics that I've been working on. And I would not have that if I had not been investing all this time in building a social media following, getting people to know who I am. And it takes work and it takes consistency. And I have to set alarms to go off all day, reminding me to make posts and stuff but i do what i got to do so that i can get that out there and hopefully people follow and buy my work now is there any particular social media channel you know i'm going to ask you that especially in the comic book niche in comic books particularly but anywhere you want to make money especially kids listen to me i know you want to be on instagram you want to be on tiktok you want to be on snapchat and stuff post on facebook and I, I know it seems like where the dinosaurs live and it it's old fashioned and you don't want to be on Facebook. That's where grandpa is. Grandpa has money. All the other teenagers that love your work and like it and say it's awesome. They don't have money to pay you to do a job. My son is figuring this out now and he's starting to build his Facebook following instead of Instagram alone because all his teenage friends from high school love his Instagram posts. None of them have money to hire him for a commission. But old people my age have money in their back pocket and want to hire for commissions. So he's starting to post in all the comic book groups and the artist groups and stuff on Facebook where all the other old fuddy-duddies are hanging out. Comics aren't as good as they used to be, blah, blah, blah. But those are the guys that have money. And they're the ones that want to spend money to get you to draw Superman the way he used to look. Or draw their character next to Batman. Or maybe draw their character in a whole book so they can publish it because they always wanted to see that done. And maybe 50 people read the book, but you just got paid to draw a comic book, dude. So post on Facebook. Build a following on Facebook. Get in the comic book groups on Facebook and start sharing your work because that's where people want to spend. I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Um, practical issues. Uh, you want your work to look professional. You want it to um, have that crispness, if I can use that term. Uh, getting back to our young person, um, is there any particular software, hardware, Starting out, you can't, I suppose, afford the most expensive stuff, but what would you say is a good thing to start with? Anything you can afford to start with is a great place to start. And I know I work digitally. A lot of other artists work digitally. You do not have to work digitally to get started working in comic books. You can order a pad of comic book pages off of Amazon for like 18 bucks, I think, and start drawing them by hand and scan them in. And, you know, I know lots of artists that do that. I hire an inker from time to time that still works traditionally and he'll print my pages out full size at 11 by 17 and he'll ink on them and scan them back in and send them to me. Um, so you don't have to work digitally. You don't have to invest $2,000 in a new computer and $4,000 in a Wacom tablet. Like I have bought refurbished office computers, you know, that have upgraded, uh, Ram that work just fine. Uh, the software, if you're going to go digitally, a lot of people talk about Photoshop. 
Photoshop's a great program. It's a whole great suite of programs. Clip Studio is the absolute best program for drawing comic books. It used to be called Manga Studio because it's designed in Japan for drawing mangas. Clip Studio kind of sounds like it's clip art, and it's not. It is the best program, hands down, for illustrating. It has so many amazing tools that Photoshop and Illustrator don't get close to. You get to mix vector and raster images together into one file. I absolutely love it. You can do animation in it. I'm doing animated openings and outros for our uh, um, our podcast. I'm doing animated scenes for my next Kickstarter. It is amazing software. The base version, I like to say it has all the bells and most of the whistles of the expensive version. And the base version goes on sale sometimes for as low as 35, 40 bucks. And I think it's like 69 or 70 bucks tops. It is easily affordable. You can get a $60 tablet and pen where you like, you're looking at the screen and drawing down here and start doing amazing work very quickly with that. If you can afford to get like an LCD type screen that you can draw on like this, I absolutely love this. They have so many different versions of these from so many different makers with different features, but like this is one from XP pen and they have them starting at like 300 bucks. I think so. I started out with one of those and it was amazing. I've had laptops that I can draw on the surface of. I've got a Microsoft Surface Pro right now that I draw on most of the time. You could do a, you know, an iPad. There's so many different ways to do it. Like do the one that you can afford, start making money and then, you know, save and upgrade, you know, and don't be afraid to upgrade. And if you're going to upgrade, upgrade to the most that you can afford. Don't put yourself in debt. Don't get yourself in a bad situation. But like, if you can cut out the movies and the lattes and save up two grand to invest in a better piece of equipment, do that. It, you're going to be so much happier if you work hard and save up for a two grand piece than getting the 800 or a thousand dollar piece. Like you're going to, appreciate it but you don't have to start with the big stuff you can start with a pencil and paper and work your way up that's what i did you've mentioned a lot of collaboration something that perhaps we artists keep missing out or i certainly do i keep thinking in pictures and images and drawing but of course a major part of comic books and uh, graphic novels all that sort of thing is having a great story so i guess there are um, very talented writers that are looking for artists or maybe an artist who doesn't know how to string a sentence together needs a writer you know so is that a big part of it or is or are most people writing and illustrating there are a whole lot of people that are writing and illustrating there's a large percentage of those people that aren't really writers and you can tell that like even Neil Adams is a great, he was a giant in the comic book industry. We lost him recently and it was a blow for many of us. He was one of my favorite artists growing up. He is a breathtaking artist and he changed the game when it came to visual storytelling in comics. He has written many of his own projects that are kind of rambling and don't really go anywhere and don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, when he's teamed with a great writer, they do breathtaking work. He can do it himself. Eh, it's not so great. Uh, I am, I'm lucky. I've been really happy with the response on green zone because I was afraid that maybe that was me. Maybe I just think I could write. Maybe this is just a cool story to me, but hearing the response from people that are so excited about it and so anxious for the next issues has reassured that fear in me that, you know, no, no, you actually can do this. You're not, you're not fooling yourself. Um, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with admitting I'm not good at this part. Like I'm not good at shipping. So I hired on with a publisher. Other people are great at that. Um, I'm a good artist and I'm a great storyteller visually with that. I bring so much to it with that. But I love collaborating with writers, too, because they bring in ideas that I wouldn't have. I bring in ideas from my end, and we usually come up with a much better product than either one of us could have done on our own. You know, they're limited with not being an artist, and 
uh, sometimes there's a little animosity between writers and artists because, you know, art gets all the attention because it's showy and, you know, you could post a paragraph. It's not going to get as much attention as my pinup is going to get, you know, it, it might be just as exciting, but nobody's going to stop to read it. Um, so I get it, but there are so many people that love teaming up. There's so many people that want to team up. There's so many people online in these Facebook groups that are looking to do their first project and they don't really have any money, but they're looking for somebody to collaborate with and see if it works. If you've never done a story before, if you've never written anything before, maybe finding somebody that has a story you're interested in would be something fun to team up on and do. And you can figure out if this is for you. Comic books is hard. I will tell you straight up, comic books is a hard job. A lot of days I work 12 to 16 hours a day, you know, just to knock out as many pages as I can because it's a tough job and a lot of people want to do it and then they get into it and realize, whoa, 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 this is way too hard for me. I just want to do pinups. I just want to do covers. I'd rather spend three days drawing one cover than, you know, having to get several pages a day drawn you know, no, that's no fun. And I understand that to me, it scratches that storytelling itch in my brain and I absolutely love it, but there's so many people out there looking to collaborate and it's so easy to find them now with the internet that absolutely join up and collaborate. I've seen some amazing stuff come from amazing collaborations. Now I've seen a lot of hype going on. Um, It's just starting, I guess, but AI uh, graphics, AI pictures, AI art, Writers who maybe, you know, the the talk goes, you can just type in a few words and AI creates the images for you. Is this, what do you think? It is, it is amazing. And I have already seen several writers I know that have quit hiring people for variant covers and stuff and just started using AI to, you know, produce their variant covers or come up with, an idea sketch for their, you know, where maybe if they want to create a brand new character out of nothing, you know, that costs more than just hiring me to draw a picture of your established character, you know? So like, you know, if I'm creating a character out of nothing and you're going to have the rights to this character, we're talking more like 250 bucks rather than like 60 bucks. And if you want to do that, you know, guys that used to would come hire somebody like me to help design that character and build it for them are now going to AI art sometimes, which gives you interesting results, comes up with cool images, but AI as of yet doesn't have the skill set to give you as curated a final design. It doesn't give you as directed a final approach, let's say, as working with a real artist that can look at what you're giving them, talk to you about your ideas and come up with a really polished finished project. It comes up with a lot of cool looking, somewhat vague images sometimes. And people are going to get better at better at putting the instructions in to get what they want. But as of yet, I don't see any real competition between us. It makes cool images, but I don't think it can give you as polished, as honed, as refined a final image as an artist that can really understand what you're looking for. The most important part, Fish, tell us about your book that you're working on. I know you've mentioned Green Zone. What's it all about? And uh, let's dive into that. Oh, Green Zone, life in the blocks. It is my baby. It follows a group of superpowered cops on their first shift on the police force as they're trying to earn their citizenship in a world where it's illegal to have superpowers. So if you get caught as a genome and they'll randomly genetically test people in school, like it's hard to not get caught. You get shipped off to the blocks, which are these giant overbuilt ghettos and the world basically throws you away and forgets about you. You lose all of your rights, your citizenship. You are a monster. You're a supervillain waiting to happen, a bomb waiting to go off. And the only way to try and get out and get your green card is to prove 
that you're not a threat to humanity by serving the greater good for five years. So if you can make it five years in the military or the fire department or the police force, you can earn your citizenship and get your green card and move out of the blocks. And so this follows a group of new recruits on their first shift and you meet all kinds of different people in this G unit where the, the genomes serve on the police force. There are people like their sergeant is a lifelong police officer. He got his citizenship and he's continued working there. Other people are desperate to reach five years and get out. Other people are just sleeping their way through shift. And if I get a couple of tickets written, they won't fire me. And, um, and this group of new recruits is woefully ill-suited to be police officers. Like Virgil is a big, scary looking eight foot lizard monster. Looks terrifying. Could not be a sweeter, kinder, quieter person. All he wants to do is get out of the blocks, open a little bookstore, hide in the back and read for the rest of his life, pretending to be anything other than a giant monster. But he can't do that unless he risks his life first. And the only thing he hates more than the police force is living in the blocks. So he's going to risk his life to try and get out. We see in the first issue, he caught his first felony charge at five years old, just because he scared some cops and it, it goes badly for him. Um, And then you end up with other people like Bellamy, who's a a female officer. She's like five feet tall, 100 pounds, little wisp of a girl covered in razor sharp quills all over her body. If she bumped into you on the subway, she could go to prison for life for unlawful use of supernatural force. So she has to figure out how am I going to become a police officer, take down genomes three times my size and not accidentally stick them in the process with one of my quills and go to prison myself. You see very quickly how stacked against them the deck is. Like Virgil very nearly gets flushed out his first day because he can't put the belt around his waist because he's eight feet tall. And if he can't put the belt on, he's out of uniform. But his training officer figures out to stick it around his wrist. And his training officer is the son of the sergeant, and he knows he can't get fired, so he doesn't really take anything seriously. And he gets away with pulling stuff nobody else would ever get away with. And so we see people fighting for their lives. You see people like his training officer, Danny Kim, that don't take anything seriously and couldn't care less. And to the world outside, you know, Virgil is a big, scary monster. Danny is just a Korean kid. His his genetic difference is so small that it's almost imperceivable. And he can walk out of the green zone with no questions asked. If Virgil tried walking out, he could get shot. And, but yet at the same time, Kim has grown up with a very sheltered life. His dad's the boss has, doesn't have to take anything seriously. He does not realize how different his life is growing up in the suburbs with his dad from Virgil growing up in the blocks alone with no family, digging his clothes out of the dumpster. And he's like, Oh, come on. We're both genomes. I get you blood. I know how life is. He doesn't have a clue how privileged he is. He doesn't have a clue how different his life is than everybody else's. Um, You see people coming from wildly different backgrounds. You see people that grew up on the edge of the green zone, people that grew up outside the green zone, people that grew up living in the blocks. And it is such a fascinating world. And it is so much fun to ride in. And it's so fascinating And it's been so interesting to me, everybody I've shown the book to so far, like friends, other collaborators, my editor, like I showed it to my editor, her husband started writing copy for this book. I showed it to one of my friends who's a writer. He started writing a whole book. He's doing a whole graphic novel for a story set in this world because he's gotten so excited about it. And to me, that reminds me of like when I watched Star Wars as a kid and it started inspiring me to create my own worlds and my own aliens and my own spaceships. And to know now that I'm inspiring other people to be creative is that is amazing. Um, the first issue went over really well. There's a source book that goes along with it that has police files on all the characters and stuff in the book. And they're all written from like human training officers point of views. So you get to see a little bit more of the bias in things and things like, you know, when they're listing scars and tattoos, like has a scar on his lower abdomen from an alleged appendectomy. Why would you lie about that? 
but you know, it just showed, ah, they can't be trusted. You never know with them. And you know, the media likes to portray it as, oh, if they wanted to, they could pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get out. There's a way to get citizenship. If they're still living in the blocks, they want to be there. They're gangsters and monsters. And you find out real quickly just how few people make it through and just how quickly you can get thrown out of the system for just about anything. And, oh, it is such an exciting world. And I never expected when I first had this idea for the story, I never expected it to seem so relevant as it does in this day and age with the police force and all the trouble with the police force that we've had coming from both sides and realizing the biases that all of us have had that we might not have realized before. And I'm hoping that, you know, if people can see how, unfair life is for Virgil and just how badly stacked against him the deck is and how he didn't get a fair shake. Maybe that could help open people's eyes to realize maybe we're not all starting from the same starting point and maybe we need to take that into consideration. I hope, you know, it's the best I could hope for, but I'm loving the response that it's getting. Uh, as you're telling me the the storyline, I'm thinking this is practically real life today. <laughs> it really is, and I I I swear I didn't write it to be that. Like I, I had a dream ten years ago with half of this book in that dream, and then I sat down and wrote the rest of it out, and it's been percolating on the back burner for ten years, and I keep talking about it with my friends at comic cons and stuff, and my son was like all right, look, if you don't make this book, somebody else is going to make it and you're going to be mad about it. But you've told too many people the story at this point. And I, I started hiring a flatter for my work, which most people probably don't know what that is. I do all of the artwork myself in the books. A lot of times people will just pencil or just ink or just color. I do it all, including the lettering. A flatter goes in for the colorist and will block out all the areas in one color, not worried about what the color is, just blocking it out in one color. So like everywhere your shirt appears on the page will all be the same neon pink. Doesn't matter what color it is. Then I use that as a reference and I click on that pink. It selects everywhere on the page that that pink is. And then I can make it the color your shirt. I need it to be. And it makes my job of coloring much faster The first time I hired her on a book, that book that I had scheduled for a month and a half to do, I got done in 12 days. And now all of a sudden I'm paid for a month and a half worth of work and I got nothing to do. And my wife was like, you need to do one of your own books. And I was like, okay. So I knocked out Green Zone in like three weeks. (laughs) But man, that flatter has sped me up so much. And that is a weird little job in art that I didn't know existed five years ago. And it's a great job. And she gets so much work thrown her way. And she does such an amazing job and has sped up my work so much. I cannot brag about her enough. Shane Kui from the Philippines. I recommend her highly. So how do we get your book? Is it... uh... Print, digital, both? Oh, yeah. You can get print copies and digital copies. It should be up for sale now on the publisher's website, fsknow.com. It's for Freestyle Comics now, but it's fsknow.com. And there's a shop there with all of the books. I think Green Zone was the 28th book that we put out through Freestyle Comics. I think we're, we're well into the 30s now. Um, you can order it there and the new Kickstarter for issues, uh, two and three will be going live on December 1st. So it, keep an eye on Kickstarter for green zone, or you can go to go Mr. Fish, go MRfish.com, And that will take you to the Kickstarter page. Once we get the pre-launch page set up. Uh, Fish, it's been fascinating chatting to you, but before we finish off, I want to ask you, um, the, the old guy's question, and um, what is wrong with mainstream comics today? A lot of old guys I know complain about the new comics. Um, my only problem with the new comics is 
essentially you can't just pick up one issue and read it anymore and know what's going on. If I want to pick up the new issue of Spider-Man, I have to pick up 16 other issues to catch up on what's going on to know what they're talking about. That's my only beef with it. Uh, a lot of people want to complain that the stories are different, man. The stories are so good. Now they're doing so much interesting stuff. There's so many new writers coming in. There's so many new voices with so many new perspectives. I love just about everything that's coming out. And unlike a lot of people my age, I'm not grumpy about new people writing new stories. I'm fascinated. I want to learn more about it. Like Ms. Marvel has become one of my favorite characters and I just absolutely love her. I am not a teenage girl, but I love Ms. Marvel. I identify with her story so much. And I identify like now with her parents so much in that storyline and have so much fun with, I just can't get enough of it. Um, I love what they're doing. My only beef is the stories being so interconnected that you can't just pick up an issue and catch up anymore. And now that the corporations have such big corporations have a hold on things like Disney will not allow you to do just whatever you want anymore, because now they're worried about shareholders and, you know, lunch boxes and toys and cartoons. And, you know, you can't just do anything cool that you want to do anymore. And, you know, when people had the freedom working on weird books, nobody bought anymore. You get amazing things like the X-Men because, you know, that was a book nobody was paying attention to and they just got to do what they want. And they created a world that we all dearly love now and makes millions of dollars with movies because they got to have fun and be free and didn't have to worry about corporate overlords. (laughs) Same sort of thing with the movies, I guess. Um, Marvel movies, all of those sort of things. Have they been, have they gone totally over the top? Should they just give it up? I, I enjoy them. I mean, not everything is going to be a magnum opus work of art. You know, not everything is going to be Avengers Endgame. And that's the one problem I think the fanboys have is they kept up in the game bigger and bigger each time. But like Avengers Endgame was the finale to this story that had been told over so many years and so many movies. You can't do that again with a new property that you're introducing, you know, like say Moon Knight, the series, you're not going to get that kind of payoff, but Moon Knight was amazing. And Ms. Marvel was amazing. She Hulk was freaking amazing. And people want to complain about She Hulk and they were so brilliant. Like that alone, they made the angry dude bros that they knew were going to be online trolling them and complaining about the show anyway, the overarching villain of the show, they knew they were going to be griping about them. So it's playing out in real time, like some kind of live action role play viral marketing campaign of people griping, just like they're griping in the show, outside the show. It was brilliant. I wish I had been in the writing room when somebody like just kicked that idea out. Like, what if we made like those guys the bad guy? And then they just went with it. It's brilliant. I was, I, oh my God, I loved it so much. But then I'm not, you know, threatened by, you know, a beautiful woman being the main character and, you know, it not being a bunch of guys smacking each other around in spandex. Like, I'm fine. I absolutely love it. And I love, I love the story about her being a lawyer just as much as, you know, her being in a skimpy outfit beating people up, you know. I'd- yeah, I've spoken like a, a like a true fan and artist. You've got to keep an open mind, keep working. I, I have no problem with them reimagining and retelling stories because, you know, who wouldn't love to have the chance to go back and retell some of those original stories again and polish off some of those rough edges and, oh, I love it. I love everything they've been doing. Before we go, tell us how people can get in touch with you, your various social media channels, your shows. You mentioned a podcast as well. Indeed. Uh, You can find me on all the social medias at Mr. Fish Comics. Uh, Sometimes it's Mr. Dot Fish Dot Comics. Sometimes it's an underscore. Sometimes it's not. Uh, I'm on TikTok. I'm locked out of my Instagram. I got my Facebook hacked. I got back in. I can't get back into my Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Mr. Fish Comics. 
our podcast is Five Star Fridays on the Agents of Geekdom Network. And you can find Agents of Geekdom on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google, anywhere you can find a podcast, Facebook group, everywhere Agents of Geekdom. And we have a different show on every night. Five Star Fridays comes on 6 p.m. Eastern, Friday nights. It's live. We go on and talk about any different kind of character and run that character down and you know where they came from when they were created what we love about them when we first found out about them our favorite storylines and it's a really fun show and the uh the fans come in and comment and ask questions and spur the conversation in different directions it's a lot of fun fish thanks so much this was fascinating and i i think we're just scratching the surface but i'm i'm gonna let you go Yeah, man, I enjoyed this so much. So, and such valuable information for guys who want to get into this business as well. Um, thanks for sharing that. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I hope to keep in touch. Thank you, man. I really enjoyed it. And hopefully, I can be a little bit of help to them out there. I love sharing any bit of tips I can because, you know, people shared it with me and it's my duty to share it with the next generation. I want to thank Fish Lee for appearing on the How to Loosen Up Your Painting podcast. I'm sure you agree, a fascinating person. Get his books, get his comics, find out what he's up to. Check out his Kickstarter campaign as well and support him with his project. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any more podcasts in the future. And if you can review the podcast as well, that would be fantastic. Thanks again. And until next time, cheers for now.